The white side. The white side. The white. It's sprinkling up here, Ron. No. Where we sat. <laughs> Do you have enough room? Otherwise, we'll get another chair. Oh, I think we're off that. Somebody can sit here in this table on this paper phone. Okay, is it time or do we still have something? We still wait. A couple, minutes. A couple of minutes. Okay, you want to be punctual? No, it's not a few minutes. It's time? Time, yeah. Yes. Okay, let's start. Uh, no, if that gets too warm again there, I better turn it off. Very good, so if we start freezing, then we put it on. Very good. Welcome tonight. Do we have any papers? If you have some papers, just let's put them in here. I'll put them in there. So that is your last paper, right? That was our agreement. Thank you. Very good. What we want to do then are a few uh, presentations and discussions together with it. So, okay, where are we? This course number four. See, we have it very orderly here. Somebody else coming? Eight. Directed in motion. Okay, where are we? I think I have also I have a paper for you. Okay, nine. Truth and or correction. Yeah, that is the theme of the day. So, test. I have the tests, right? And uh, then I have one here which I want to give to you. Let me see if we are here. Okay, these are the two I got, and I will look them through and give them to you the next time. Okay. Yeah, do we have Ismail Majid Al-Sunaidi here? No? No. Okay, so then we don't have to talk about it. Okay, can somebody take it home? No, nobody here who knows him. Okay. Very good. Okay, some announcements. So I have all the tests, I think, most of them, and I gave test to Matthew back to you. Then, home presentation, so how should we do it? It would be good to have, you know, one or two on form, but however you want to do it. If we have two papers on form, that's not so bad neither. Or two papers on our camera, or two, uh, no, not our camera, uh, harness, that is okay too. Or form, or uh, our mouse insert. If you want to do something about somebody else, that's okay too. Okay, who would be the next time? We can have two every time. Or one or two. Who would like to do something next time? Somebody ready? I'm to sure talk I'm about sure you the up, man of your choice. <laughs> the man who made you happy. I haven't picked out my third death study yet, so I, I can do it. Huh? You can do something? Yeah, I was actually, let's go over here, I had a couple underlines. Okay. Okay. So, can you uh, give us a presentation on your man? Who sure. is your man? Uh, let's see. I had a bunch of. I think it's going to be Chrome. Chrome. Okay. Good. Is anybody else who wants to do it the next time? No. Okay. We have one the next time. Very good. Okay. Then excursion to the mosque tomorrow. If anybody's interested in that, uh, we talked about Islam, and uh, um, Dustin is always very much interested. Round table meeting, we have it on Saturday. Can you come? Yes. Yep. Good. Okay, Karen will be there again. Okay. So we can celebrate again. And then, uh, online course, I mentioned that psychological elements. If you have anybody who's interested, it's almost full. But um, if we have a good person, I'm glad to open up again. Um, then, uh, then in fall, I mentioned about religion revolution, and we have a publisher even who will come the class and he wants to have a book about it and then religion and social ethics but these are 300 level courses so just if you know somebody who may be interested contemporary issues do we have some we have a few and okay. I would like to start out with yeah? I was going to say uh, big news on the gay rights front so yeah okay we can take that let's take something which <coughs> just has happened a few minutes ago the president gave a speech in Brussels. Nobody listens to the president anymore. Huh? <laughs> 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 I listen to him more than one game. For itself. And plus Brussels. Okay, let's talk about this and then we can go one after the other. 
Okay. Did anybody hear the, the thing there, the presence? You did. Okay. Very good. Uh, what can we say about it? From the critical theory of point of view. I thought it was really interesting how he doesn't want to liken uh, the Crimea going to Russia with Kosovo gaining independence Yeah. From Serbia. Yeah. The NATO intervention there. You know what I mean? Right. So the Russians can't intervene in uh, the Crimea, but NATO can intervene and decide that Kosovo can break off from Serbia and become its own independent yeah. country. Well, we mentioned, you know, the whole uh, issue of philosophy of history, where Hegel says, you know, the only thing that we can learn from history is that we cannot learn anything from it, and the reason is because every situation is unique. So Albright and uh, and, and uh, uh, the other one, Clinton, both of them, uh, you know, compared Samar Putin with Hitler and Kosovo with uh, Crimea, and so on. So that is a very dangerous thing. So. There may be some analogies, some, you know, you know, so one probably should not stop it all the way. One can always remember something. But um, it is very questionable if, if it really fits because of the new situation. And that is also, you know, when we take Benjamin or so, and, and uh, Benjamin thinks we should remember. And then when you remember, you know, that will motivate us. Hegel was also critical of that because the new situation has its new dynamics. And uh, memory is always too weak for this new dynamic, which comes with all its power and overcomes people in their decision-making process and so on. So, um, but nevertheless, I mean, remembrance is important, and um, you know. But the, the question is, uh, what are the limits of all of this remembrance? Okay, so that was one thing of Kosovo. So, does anybody remember Kosovo still? Didn't you go there? You did. No, we you went didn't to go there. When we were there. Somebody went there. Uh, a long time ago, people traveled even to Kosovo. So, so they split it up there. Uh, there were, um, what was it, Muslim people right, who uh, attacked Serbs or whatever. Yeah, the Kosovars. So, and then the Serbs reacted. And, what, and then, uh, what was it? There was a vote. Was a vote taken to separate right, from Serbia? And that's how it was. So, so they, they cut really Serbia into pieces. And that is something which we should keep in mind, to what extent the NATO and the United States follow a politics which Caesar formulated. You know, that means divide et impua. Divide them up and then, uh, you know, conquer them. And that then they split up Yugoslavia. And now it seems to me that they are also splitting up the Ukraine. Carter, you know, is such a pious man, a peanut farmer and such a... I really like him as a humane person and so on. But he had no doubts about it, that it probably, very probably, it would be split up. And and I think that is what, what will be coming. So, so, but, uh, so what is the difference? I think what the President didn't see at all, and that I don't understand, and that is that these 97% of the population of the Crimea voted to become an independent state. Now that should fit into liberalism, self-determination of little countries. They determined themselves and they determined that they wanted to be independent and they wanted to join the Russian Federation, which are 12 independent states which have somehow a loose relationship with each other. So they will be the 13th state. And if the eastern part of the Ukraine will separate from the western part, they will become the 14th state of this. So. I don't see why, why one can say that the referendum in the Crimea was illegal. It was against <coughs> international law. How? In God's name. I mean, every nation has the right to determine itself where it wants to go. Now here, the states have no right to deceit. I mean, that's part of the constitution here. In Yugoslavia, they could deceit, but uh, uh, could get out. But they had to pay their bills, first of all, and they didn't. And that way, the separation was illegal. And uh, so, okay, so that is the one thing. The other thing was uh, he answered some of the charges which come out of Moscow. And one of them is that the United States are supporting fascists. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the president said, this is absurd, that's outrageous, and, and so on and so on. But the fact is that they are were fascists. And the fascists were allied with the neoliberals. They made that upheaval there because the president.
president was pro-Russia and he did not want to sign the agreement with the European Union. That's when they went on the Independence Street there. I, I went there when I visited Kiev several times. So, and then they, they mutine, mutinied. And uh, so there are two sides to it. One side says, you know, the snipers were sitting on the roofs and shot people and maybe 70 of the protesters were killed. The others say that the police force had no arms. And they were not allowed to, to use their arms if they had some and so on. So you have a picture of both sides and nobody knows who killed what and so on. So, but nevertheless, the, it was a continuation of 1989. 1989 was a neoliberal victory. A, a neoliberal counter-revolution was successful. The counter-revolution of the 1920s, where 12 capitalist countries marched into Russia, uh, failed. Also, when they sent Hitler, he came to the Volga, but it failed on the Volga. But 1989, the counter-revolution did succeed, probably because of some kind of a misunderstanding, too, because those people who rebelled in Hungary and so on, they did not want to have capitalism. They wanted to have a different type of socialism, they, a little bit more maybe to social democracy or a reformulation of Marxism, and they didn't like Stalinism and so on. So, but they they did not want to go where they were. And I was in two places where I observed that. One was in Dubrovnik, the other one was in Yalta, and the other one was in Rostock. So three places. So when the wall fell, I was around that time. I was in all three places, and there were people who didn't want to change anything. But then there were also some people who saw on television Mercedes and so on, and they thought they would get all that. That was true. But the majority of people wanted to have a different type of socialism, and not that market thing there which, which came then. So, and, I mean, first there were fascists there, and uh, with their flags and their symbols, but then they also burned down the synagogue there, which was outside of Kiev, that was the place where the, the SS whistled and the Jews had to gather there before they were transported into the quarry where 36,000 of them were killed and also to gather for being transported into the concentration camp, which mm -hmm. Dustin visited. So, <laughs> um, and, and then they also made a law that Russian should not be spoken anymore. So a very extreme nationalistic uh, movement, which had fascist symbolism and had anti-Semitism. Now, but one thing is, this last thing seems not to have been directly uh, supported by Washington, but more by the European Union, it seems. While the other thing, Washington, CIA, and also the economic, uh, what is it called, I, I said, but uh, the Economic Monetary Fund, Economic IMF, hmm? International Monetary Fund, International Monetary Fund, yeah, and and the World Bank and so on. So they were all active there, but it seems that maybe uh, Washington was not so directly involved in that last thing. But there is one colorful counter-revolution after the other, and that was just the last cry, and and it miscalculated. I think they didn't uh, believe that the Crimea would have that referendum. But that doesn't make that referendum illegal. I mean, the president is a constitutional lawyer. He must know what is legal and illegal, but he has not made his point why the Crimea's <coughs> referendum was illegal. So um, now he, the speech was moderate in that way, he did not threaten with military intervention, and nobody wants it anyway. So, um, but he, uh, you know, promised all kinds of punishments for Russia, and I think that will not get very far neither, because the Europeans are too closely connected with Russia, the gas and electricity and all that. So, there, I don't think it you know, will go very far. One of the things that's most interesting is because is he constantly says that the referendum is unconstitutional. Yeah. But to uphold the Constitution would be to undo what happened in Kiev, yeah. which means Viktor Yanukovych is still the president. Right, right. If we were to yeah, maintain right. the Constitution. So why he says one thing is unconstitutional, but the Kiev, the, the coup d'etat, and they had, I don't know, before, mm -hmm. this coup d'etat,
Tai is certainly non-constitutional, and then he should not support that government, which has not yet been uh, recognized right. by anybody. Because they voted with Molotov cocktails, right. you know what I mean, yeah. and bricks right. and whatnot. Exactly. And they even had some kind of a treaty with the European Union that this old president would stay until there would be election in spring and so on. Instead of that, they, uh, they terrorized him out of town. And he went to Russia. First, they didn't even know where he was in the bunker or in the Crimea, but he obviously went to Russia. Right? So, so that was, in, in the speech, you know, that was not entirely clear there. But now if we look from the trees, you know, to the, to the forest, it was a liberal type of a speech, right? It's very important for us here uh, that we know where the critical theory is allied. And we have this scheme there. There are liberal societies. These liberal societies, because of their liberalism, develop a lot of uh, uh, injustices. So we have that now. If you look at that channel there where that minister is talking about MBNC, what MB? The CBN? C the no, MCBN or whatever. Oh, MSNBC. MSNBC, yeah, by all these abbreviations, they make me, drive me nuts. But <laughs> nevertheless, the, uh, uh, the, these guys, they, uh, you know, they, so you have you have the right there, that's Fox there, and then you have CNN, which is somewhere in the middle, they talk about the airplane all the time. And then you have this MB, MSNBC, uh, which yeah. is as left as you can get, and then I think Fox is as right as you can get. So that is where everything is frozen. Uh, when you go further on the right, you are out of the field. If you go further to the left, you're out of the field. So, <laughs> nevertheless, so we have, and, and this, this MB and C, whatever, they emphasize these injustices all the time. Today, against women and uh, minimum wage and family wage, don't even talk about family wage, but living wage and so on. So, or uh, unemployment compensation where people pay into and then they don't get it. So, um, or, or food stamps or whatever. So, these, and, and then the unbelievable discrepancy of the class system. Um, in, in, which is growing all the time. So that even Wall Street talked about, you know, the country clubs when they uh, listen to uh, to the president and his redistribution of wealth. They see the guillotine already before them, but they invented the guillotine, and the guillotine will get them the third estate if they don't handle that right. So what has happened in Europe and what is happening here is because of these injustices, then left wing. People come in, or you know, they, they emphasize equality and they emphasize, uh, uh, you know, distribution of wealth, and then it sounds like socialism. And when that happens, then the other sides, the Coach Brothers or whatever, they pay then these quasi-fascist neoliberals or further to the right in order to do in those so-called socialists. And so, so that is how civil society then restabilizes itself again. Now, the president, when you look at the whole picture, so he gives, uh, like a law professor, he spoke to youngsters, I think most of them may have been Belgian students or whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you could see the faces, very nice and, and beautiful faces, young people, and so, uh, like a law professor, he talked to, so quasi-academically, and it was through and through a liberal speech, but not a neoliberal speech, it was a Roosevelt liberal speech. So it was a speech which um, would say, for instance, uh, uh, we don't want to have things all for the few, but for the many as well, you know. Um, or the emphasis on equality all over the place. We mentioned once, you know, that fascism is a strong, has a strong emphasis on inequality, racial, class, national inequality. Um, the liberals pay lip service sometimes, and the president does that to equality, but equality means then for them equality of opportunity. Uh, so, and he himself standing there was an example. It played an important role for his audience that he was an African American. He also mentioned that his grandfather was fighting with Patton. Now, I fought against Patton there for, for two weeks in, in these battles. Maybe I met his grandfather there somewhere. As a matter of fact, an ambush in which I was involved in 90, a state, most of them were black soldiers. And uh, this, and I think I told you that in the beginning, this uh, unbelievable meaninglessness of war, where, um, let me tell you it again, they were in the campaign, so the 
Patton's army had broken through across the Rhine River and marched down it. So I was not sent to Russia, but it was, I was sent against uh, Patton then. There was a young officer. And so um, behind that was I was trained in Büdingen, uh, the town Büdingen. And um, I think I told you that an uncle of mine had called the general to take care of me and not to send me at <laughs> the most uh, dangerous places or whatever, which he, which he didn't. But he called me in, the general, and he was very friendly and uh, uh, said he would do what he can. No, no, not even that. He, I didn't, he didn't even go that far. But he wanted to rescue that town building, and so he made the attack against the, uh, the uh, Patton uh, maybe 30 miles further to the to the east, uh, and Hanau was a town there, and then uh, where where then the battles took place. So, and uh, so at the end stage of the battle, the general wanted to uh, show the Americans the last time what uh, German strategy and tactics was, and and we were celebrating in an inn uh, the birthday, the 18th birthday of the innkeeper's daughter. And so we had champagne in the middle of the battle. There was a few soldiers. There was all this food there. And uh, so we were drinking. And then the Patton's army came slowly through the valley. And uh, we had cut trees. So the, the tanks had to remove the trees. And it went a little bit slow. But suddenly they shut through the windows there. And so the general said, well, it's time to go now. But we want to show them a last time what uh, German strategy is. And he had about 400 men left. So he led them around the mountain back to the same street. At the end of the street there was a little village and people were horribly frightened. People were particularly frightened of black soldiers, which was strange because the black soldiers were the real friendly ones. They were the ones who gave chocolate to the children and so on. But how that is, propaganda. There you have this propaganda. So you be devil and demonize the enemy and so on. So oh, this little villager and the little pigs, I still have it in my ears, were, were screaming and the children were screaming and Oh, it was already five o'clock, and Americans only fought to five o'clock. We were only paid to five o'clock, so they started eight and then went to five. And then they played cards. I saw some four lines and so on, and put their gun on automatic. So the, the gun was then maybe three or four guns. They were shooting and stopped again and shooting again. Did all by themselves, but they played cards. And so, so I saw it even. I had a reconnaissance of people, four people, and I went very close to the tents, and I saw them, and I heard the. American language the first time by just listening to him. They had no idea who, who was there. So nevertheless, he led them there, and so up in the street, maybe a mile away, and so the, the tanks rolled on, there was a German bunker beside the inn, and so they took some flamethrowers and fried all the soldiers in the bunker there, like, like chickens. And, and then they went on, and had no idea, you know, what was at the street up there. So and uh, when the, the general put maybe 400 people there along the, the highway, the up on a small highway, though, on, on, the, on the little hill on it, and then they slowly came, and uh, with their hands in their pockets and the gun hanging up there and a cigarette in the mouth and, and the right and the left of the tanks, the German tanks, and they were you know, going very slowly, and they marched side by side, and they looked forward to resting there. The sun was setting slowly, and so the general then gave the order to shoot, and then they were no heavy weapons, but just uh, guns and, and machine guns too. And so they strafed the, the highway there back and forth, and the whole thing lasted maybe three minutes or something like that. And then uh, he pulled them all back, and uh, then the Americans were shocked and uh, had not expected, that's what an ambush is, and they started to, the tanks all turned their, their barrels against that hill, and they shot into that hill now, and, and they did that all night long, as a matter of fact. But since the hill, what, what was the trick now, and that was the stupid thing, the trick was that the general knew what the, uh, how high a barrel could be lifted uh, in the tank, how high it could go. And so it couldn't go high enough in order to shoot beyond the hill, so therefore they all shot into the hill. So eight years later, I went to the same place. In the meantime, I had been here again, and I got engaged in, in Switzerland, and uh, we married. That's my wife up there. And um, so we went to that inn there, <coughs> and uh, the innkeeper was still there. And I said, well, do you remember what happened eight years ago when your daughter celebrated her 18th birthday? And, and he said, yeah, I remember that exactly. 
they, they were all these guys, they were in my house, and at night they shot all my cows. He had some black cows. They, 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 th they thought they were tanks, and they were all drunk, and, and so they shot his cows. I wasn't even there when, when that took place. And then they celebrated, yeah, birthday, that's true. And, and I said, well, what happened then? Well, there was a horrible noise up there, <coughs> up the road to the next village. And I said, how long did it take? Well, two or three minutes or so, or shorter. And, and I said, what happened then? Well, he said, then they brought the, the body bags back. And I said, how many body bags? He said, well, I think I counted 94 or so. That means 94 American soldiers, 18, 19, 20 years old, from Mississippi or wherever, who did not even know where on the map they were or why they were there. And Patton's army had already moved further to Aschaffenburg and to Würzburg, and Patton wanted to go to Berlin. They wanted to be there earlier before uh, uh, the, the Russian general there from Stalingrad would be there. And then he got the order that he had to go south because they suddenly thought that um, Hitler would make a last stand in, in Bavaria where he had his house and his bunker and so on. But Hitler decided to stay in Berlin. So that was for Patton, was one of his moments, tragic moments in his otherwise tragic life. Anyway, so, uh, and, and so it had no strategic meaning at all anymore. It, it was a mobbing up of a side valley. That was all. And they had to die for this. So, I mean, this is always for me uh, symbolical for, and it was not a war crime. So I, when I surrendered later on, they didn't even talk about it. Nobody could talk about it. Because it is entirely legitimate to set an ambush and kill as many people as you want to kill. So, um, and, and that also shows, you know, how, how far the human species has come because um, you would think, you know, that this would be a time of revenge, where you take revenge for these immense ca uh, casualties you had. And there's the Geneva Convention, which forces people to to re repress their killer instinct, and most of the time they did. So we have made progress, and therefore we also... So on one side, it, it's, it's an experience of unbelievable nihilism, but on the other hand, it gives you also hope in a certain sense that we can uh, get over what the president called today the dark side in, in us, that we uh, that one can reduce that dark side in the long run. So, uh, nevertheless, um, the so uh, about the president's speech. Now back to that. So it was a liberal speech, and uh, the president himself uh, is a proof that this liberalism somehow works because he himself came from the lower classes um, and uh, uh, went to Harvard and could make it. That is liberalism's uh, uh, promise of uh, freedom of opportunity. So when we ask you know, about truth, the truthfulness of a speech like that, we, we don't even ask that. It was a strange vacillation because some of these speech acts were truthful. They were ranging truthful and cruel, and you could see it in the faces of the students uh, that it was um, uh, it, that they had the feeling, you know, that it's genuine. But then there were other things, you know, which which were not so genuine. No? But uh, let me tell another genuine one. He talked about Iraq, and he did not say that Iraq was a good thing. He said, "I was against Iraq. We had uh, we had big discussions in the states." And so it was obvious that he thought that Iraq was a mistake. Um, but then, then he said, but we did it under international law, right. and we didn't take their territory, and yeah. we didn't eat up yeah, their resources. Yeah, that is where it became untrue then, right? Because we, do, we did take two-thirds of the oil that belongs to us. So, so there were these sentences, you know, which were truthful, and then there were sentences which, uh, which were... Well, you would say out, outright lies in a certain like Goebbels sense. or something, hmm? you know, it's like Goebbels would do yeah, the truth, right, truth yeah. big lie. Truth, well, truth, Goebbels truth. was better at that than, than the president <laughs> is, you know. Um, so, but let's say for a moment, you know, that's a philosophical question, what we mean when we say truth, you know. Um, because all the critical theories talk about truth all the time, and nobody is doing that any longer. So, uh, uh, we, in our sciences, sociology, and so on, we, we make protocol statements you know, this is this, the sun is shining or whatever. And we don't say that these sentences are true. Uh, we say they are correct, you know. And what we mean is that a uh, uh, st uh, protocol sentences is in agreement with what can be observed out there. So the sun is 
dries rain. It does it dries. It rains. It doesn't rain. So when I say, look at how nice it rains out there, then you know, you know that protocol sentence is not correct or whatever. But truth means something else, and we have to see, and we have said that many times now, um, that the critical theory, of course, is the air of idealism, right? So idealism, it is German idealism, and it was an unbelievable culture peak in the West. What is a culture peak? Uh, in, in, in Greece, you know, when you have this cluster of Plato and Aristotle and the tra tragedians, you know, to, and the historians, to and, uh, and the tragedy right, the Sophocles, and so on. So it is where suddenly, you know, architecture and sculpture and poetry and philosophy come together and reach an unbelievable climax. Not because there are geniuses there, but because of an accumulation of experiences which suddenly all come together and they really make these individuals and these great individuals whom we remember more than the other way around. So a similar great thing happened then in, the, in, in, in Germany around 1800. So you have Kant and you have Schelling and you have Fichte and you have Hegel. So that is then called idealism. And you have subjective idealism, which is Kant. That means that we construct things. That's where the word construction comes from all the time. Um, so when I look at the tree there, there is some material out there, but the categories in my head really form and shape those things in cause and effect and time and space and so on. So um, that was the discovery of uh, of, uh, of, of Kant, and nobody can go back behind that. So that is called subjective idealism. And then there was objective idealism, that is Fichte and Schelling. So that meant that these categories, it was called transcendentalism, by the way, not, it has nothing to do with transcendence, but transcendentalism means the forms which are in my mind and which make my experience of that tree or that girl or whatever possible in the first place. So that's called transcendentalism. And we had transcendentalists here. We had Emerson and Thoreau who were transcendentalists. That means they were really German idealists. And they had a tremendous impact. Emerson gave uh, talks for four hours to farmers uh, in, in churches or whatever. So there was a real movement here. And it goes up to the, the great... Uh, um, the, the, who wrote the, the, um, uh, uh, the leaves of grass? The Whitman, 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 who would say, you know, great country needs a great uh, philosopher, and this great philosopher is Hegel. So, um, so the idealism was very strong in this country, and I think it was up to um, up to the Great Depression that it was really strong that way, and and some of it has has survived even. So, okay, so now. What the, they hold on somehow to the to the idea of truth of idealism, and fascism was, as the president said today, returned to barbarism. He said, "You have this here on this continent where you went to power. That was fascism, and that was true. And so uh, Christianity was was threatened, and also German idealism was threatened, and they wanted to rescue some of that. I think that was the mission." That was the mission why Benjamin did not go to Jerusalem. He thought they, the Jews, had a mission for, for Europe, to rescue what constituted Europe. And what constituted Europe, that is, uh, that is Jerusalem, and that is Athens, and that is Rome. And so, but what is that idea? What was it? They, one could call it um, the truth. It is a metaphysical type of a truth. And so you have different definitions of truth, and one is that what the the correspondence truth you could say, where my protocol sentence fits. So all sociological textbooks and so on, they consist of protocol sentences. But then the, the these guys, the the last great metaphysicians there in, in idealism, they had another idea of truth, namely that a thing would somehow agree with itself. It was true when it agreed with itself. So they would say that the notion uh, uh, that the notion really exists, or 
that the notion and reality are one with each other. Now that is a little bit complicated now. As an example, you could take uh, that the soul is the notion and the body is the reality. So somebody who is really alive, it is a synthesis of the soul, the notion, and the body is the reality. So truth is the correspondence of the notion, like man or family or state or whatever, of that notion and the reality. Now what happens when somebody dies, then of course the notion is separated from the body. Now the body still exists, but it is not any longer real anymore. And because it's not real, it disintegrates. So that means there is the possibility that something can exist without being real. That means you can have a, a family, a failed family, where, so, where the sociologist or the social worker goes in and he says, look, they all kill each other, they throw the dishes against each other. That's not a family. Well, it exists as a family, and the sociologist will take it as a family. That's the family seabird there. But Hegel would say it is not a real family. It exists, but it's not real. So a failed state, like Michigan, in terms of a culturally failed state, you could say it does definitely exist. Nobody doubts the exist of the state of Michigan, but it is not really a state. And with religion, it can be the same way. The notion of religion may not be real, but the religion may still be around. So the Greek religion existed for a long time without being real. That is the possibility. It could be possible that Christianity is still standing around. You had increased the temple and the sculptures and so on. That was all still there. It was no longer real. Somehow the spirit or the notion had left it and moved somewhere else. I have sometimes the thesis, you know, that a religion could never be overthrown by another one if it, ha if it was still real in itself and if it had not been weakened by inner contradictions and so is a good example because the two gods were both infinite they were uh, 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 made each other finite so that was a logical uh, uh, you know logical mistake in a certain sense and therefore, when the, when the Islamic armies came, um, the, there was no real resistance any longer. And I wonder if the same thing was not also true with the Germanic tribal religions, so that religions cannot do what they're supposed to do, namely to solve the theodicy problem, or the meaning problem, that they cannot give people meaning anymore <coughs> in the catastrophe which they experience. For instance, the Roman army marching into their villages or whatever. And the guards don't give adequate answers. That is the theodicy question. And it's the question of meaning. And if that is gone, then it's very easy that uh, another army or another religion can be imposed on these people. And I wonder if that has happened for, uh, for us here in, uh, with our Ameri uh, Amer uh, India, the Native Americans here. Uh, we don't know in what condition their religion was when the Spaniards hit them. And then, of course, they were annihilated. So, therefore, we don't know, you know, what really happened to their religion, or if their religion could give the meaning in spite of the fact what was happening to them. If the buffalo or the great spirit or whatever did not function anymore and everything was falling apart in their families and they were killed by the, by the Union Army or whatever, uh, you know, if it still could give meaning to this type of suffering and, and death and so on. That is the test thing of, of religion. And so when religion cannot do that anymore, then it is not real any longer. But it may very well exist. So let's see the, uh, the priestess in the uh, temple of Apollo in, in Delphi in Greece. I visited that temple several times. She talked still to Socrates and he talked to generals and gave them wisdom and so on. He talked to Socrates and said he was the wisest man in Athens and then Socrates went downtown and uh, tried to prove that point of the Pito was her name. And uh, But then one day she didn't talk anymore. But the temple was still there and Apollo was still there. So religions can survive uh, 
their disappearance in a certain sense. So they are not real any longer, but they still exist. And families, you know, or marriage can still exist, but it's not real. So that people really, if they stay together for 50 years, it doesn't mean that it is still real. Uh, it may be that they were hanging by, by uh, boredom or by not wanting to break out and not uh, making waves or whatever it may still keep them together, but it is dead. Uh, it is it is not real any longer. So this is very important to to have this notion of the truth in order to understand the idealists and I think also to understand the critical theorists in a certain sense. So if you have a sentence by Hegel, you know, only what is real is rational and what is rational and real. That has been misunderstood continually because but they were saying, for instance, that he was a conservative. That means the Russian state existed, therefore it was rational. But that is not what it means now. Um, so because, you know, Hegel was uh, charged with high treason after his death. So obviously he would not have been charged with high treason if he had not been critical of the Prussian state. But when a positivist, you know, who thinks that when something exists that's also real, sees it and uh, talks about it, that's one thing. When a dialectician looks at it, then it sounds completely different. That means the, the, the state is only real when it's rational, and it's only rational when it's real. That means only when the notion of the state is real, then it is more than existence, and so on. So, and that has something to do with the whole struggle against positivism, which may be so ununderstandable, right? Because the sociologists in our campus do not make that difference. They study what exists. That means what is the case. That's what they study. And they cannot make a difference between appearance and essence. Or what, or that means that what appears is the essence. And therefore, there is also no possibility now to change anything, because um, that is when, when these positivists came from West Germany and took the chairs of the professors in East Germany, and the students were so unhappy, because the professor never told them anything where they would go, where society would go, and how it could be improved, and how it could be made better, and so on. So that is the reason why the critical theorists are opposed to positivism. And that is also the nice thing that our positivists here in the department are tolerant enough to let critical theorists work in there and uh, to get your dissertation and, and so on. They are very supportive in spite of the fact that they don't understand <coughs> a word of what we say. <coughs> that is, I mean, that has to be recognized, right? Uh, okay, but the main thing is that we know that the truth concept is very important and body and soul is maybe a good image how how uh, how that could be understood so uh, the 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 soul is the notion the body is the reality um if the if body and soul are separated the body still exists for a little while but the whole thing is dead and that happens also to families and that happens to uh, societies to states and, and to religions and, and so on so very important <laughs> difference. Okay, anything else about uh, about our Obama fellow? Um, now, uh, it was idealistic. The whole thing was idealistic. So, but that they have in common, all of them. The Bush also had this idealism, and the idealism is that that there is this idea of freedom. So, the purpose of history is freedom. And he, the President, the United States, and the Europeans, we are all for freedom. That is what we want to promote. And uh, the Europeans fought against fascism, of course. They did not fight against fascism. Three million of them, three million fascists from all these countries who were in that room where the President was, all marched with Hitler against socialism and killed him. And so on. so <laughs> the, um, that is where it gets all kooky there. But the surface, the surface of the talk, uh, is uh, is intact in a certain sense. If you don't know about these things, you you cannot say this speech act is wrong and this speech act is untrue and this speech act is true. 
and so on. It was a continual mixture between those two. So, but the, uh, the so we want to go to freedom, and freedom means that everybody has to be equal, and that everybody has to determine his own fate. Uh, individuals and and uh, uh, and, and uh, states too. Now, well, that's what the Crimea did. <laughs> so, Crimea is obviously, you know, part of this history of freedom. Uh, but uh, he never said what that freedom means now, except that it is the freedom of choice. So, you know, the Crimea people should have the choice now to go this way or that way, and so did everybody else. But this freedom of choice is not what the idealists meant originally. Idealists, uh, f the freedom of being is, and here we have form, of course, this being thing there. The freedom of being is the basis of the freedom of choice. And the freedom of being is the absence of alienation. Now, the president presides over a nation which has innumerable alienations. Did he deny that? No, he did not deny it. So, he himself is, uh, you know, African-American. And he indicated here and there this alienation, but he then stressed, you know, that they fought and and through this fighting, they had success in a certain sense. So the forms of alienation can be can be removed, and that's part of liberalism. So there's the women, you know, the women alienation between men and women, <coughs> in many forms, down to the leather payment which women get, and so on. So there is racial alienation, there is also generation alienation. And he addressed the young ones in the room particularly, so he wanted to speak to the younger generation, and so that he himself belonged to another generation. So he tried to overcome this type of generation alienation, and uh, so uh, ethnic uh, alienation, and so on. So the more a society is alienated, the less it is free. The main thing is this, with these many and the few. Now there was a time, according to this idealistic idea of history, where only one was free, the king in, in Africa or in the Near East, and then the Greeks are supposed to be those where a few were free then. And that is what Kennedy said, that is our ideal in turn. Not considering there were only 4,000 were free and 100,000 slaves. I hope that this is not what we want to imitate. And there's the question, you know, is it a lack of education, or is it a conscious fortification, or what happened to the liberals when they talk that way? So, But the real issue is that, of course, instead of the few slaves, the slaveholders, then in the late Roman Empire came the few feudal lords. And feudalism developed out of the Roman Empire already. So then for a thousand years you had feudal lords, there were few, <coughs> and then when they guillotined them, then you have the capitalists now, the few, you know. And, and uh, so, but the question is not that the few and the many, the promise or the utopia is that all should be free. All is more than the many. So that means according to the idealistic philosophy of history, the one is free, that is, it follows the notion of history, see, because one is the singular, the few are the particular, and then comes the universal. That means all are free. So if the historical process is real, then it follows the notion. But if it does not follow the notion, it does exist, but it's not real, and it's not meaningful, and it's full of alienation and despair and so on. So now this thing, what he himself does is, that he takes, by the way, he didn't talk about the freedom of all at all, but if he would have spelled it out, then he would have said, well, um, the freedom of all, what they do with the freedom of all, which is a Christian <coughs> and Islamic uh, and Jewish utopia, which has never existed, but they have transformed it into an ideology, that means a false consciousness, which legitimates the rule of the few over the many. That is the swindle, the whole thing. That means it's the pseudon proton. It is the first lie on which all from which all other lies are flowing. And there comes something through, you know, that the president does come from the oppressed 
classes in this country and that he has this memory and so but he doesn't belong to them anymore. You know, he would not be there if he had not moved from the many to the bourgeoisie, if he had not joined the black bourgeoisie. Without that, he could not even have become a real community organizer in, in Chicago, not to speak to enter Congress and so on. The Congress to which he speaks has no representation of 250 million people of the fourth estate. There is no labor party. That means he is comes from a bourgeois party, and he has another bourgeois party, and it's slightly different, the two wings of the same party. They could have one party, really, with two wings. And uh, so he represents one wing of them, but he is still part of that liberalism, which comes from Spinoza originally, but also from Voltaire, and then it has a Protestant Calvinistic background as well. So, but this is where then things could become confused, and one wonders sometimes how somebody ten, can take a job like this um, if he didn't know exactly when he got into it, or if he gets got conditioned <coughs> that he cannot see the contradictions underlying every statement which he makes. Uh, the you know then it becomes entirely formal. You have one book here which says material democracy. It's entitled formal democracy. So what is democracy? It is voting. So it is the formality, not the content, which what you vote, but it is that you can vote. And there we have all these problems in all the states there where, where they want to limit the voting rights of the black people and so on. So, but I mean he. Um, the audience got the impression he, he doesn't want to lie about these things. Uh, they had the impression that he was as honest about these things. He did not say that we have reached it. He would say, you know, we want to get there. or to. So um, Habermas did that with Hegel's statement there about uh, what is rational is real. So he said, what shall be rational will be real, or what shall be real, etc. He put it in the future tense. And Hegel, in some writing, did it also in the future tense. So it is not something which is already present, but something which is to be reached. That idea was there. So he did not he did not pretend, you know, that all that liberalism was really achieved or reached or whatever. But the the uh, uh, bombastic character of that what does not fit, you know, that 250 million are disenfranchised, not only women or whatever. The whole working class, that means those who produce the wealth, are excluded, don't have their own class member representing them. And it's something which you can see in every discussion which they have, you know, where, they, where this guy there in the MBS, there was this left-wing uh, television station there, um, where he blames the other side, you know, he, he always ends with, I'm talking to those who take a bath after work. <laughs> <laughs> take a bath after work. I hope they do, and I hope they do before work as well. So, but that is symbolical. So that station wants to talk in the name of this working class and the working women and so on. But he is a bourgeois himself, you know. These they, they, sometimes they say where they are coming from, and the CNN guy, you know, he worked himself up slowly. He was a speechwriter, and so he came also from below. So they. There are a lot of people who do come from below, but when they go up, they change their class character and, and the class personality and so on. Otherwise, they would never get through. And so this is an unbelievable burden in terms of inner criticism. That was another category which we use all the time. Right? We don't judge the president by socialistic standards or whatever, but by his own standards and by his own values and so on. And there are immense, gigantic, gigantic type of contradictions which he has to face all all day long. So, and so it is not only the right wingers in Congress, but it's also his own <laughs> are a bourgeois party, and uh, both are capitalistic parties. So when one shouts at the other, it shouts at itself at the same time. When they say, you know, the Coach Brothers or whatever pay you. Or, or the, Democratic Party is paid too. Both parties are paid all the time. So, whatever his, his one wing of the liberals says against the other wing, it always hits itself in the same process. And they are the process of self consumption and self annihilation in, in the whole process. So, uh, 
uh, so that about the speech, I think that is about all there. The, what was interesting for me was that the grandfather was in Patton's army there, which I ambushed him. And uh, then also uh, he himself, in the, that he was in Africa at some time, and also in other countries, which probably helped him to become a nice human being, which I think nobody in the room uh, denied that he is a nice human being. And they are not so enthusiastic anymore as they were when he came and went to Berlin before he was a president and so on. So he has lost political capital without doubt. But I think the judgment is that he is a decent person, but uh, you know the job here which has to do uh, somehow makes him into something else. The thing, the daily, you know, uh, bombing of people by this, uh, what is it, these airplanes there, pilot drones, the drones, stone strikes, and so on, uh, that is unconstitutional, you know. All these are acts of war, and the Congress has not declared war to any of these people to uh, whom we bomb. Rudy? Uh, yeah. A few weeks ago, the Pentagon said it's moving drone bases to Battle Creek. Really? So Fort Custer is going to be one of the places where the drones are being sent from there? Uh, yeah, the police wants to get some too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. Actually, I have a student, one of my classes is a drone pilot. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. I thought that was pretty interesting. So when I talk about <laughs> the uh, the unconstitutional basis of drone warfare, when we talk yeah. about war and terrorism. Uh, yeah, well, they have a whole group of lawyers who want to make it somehow prove that it is legal or whatever, but they haven't come to any place yet. But let's see, you know, when we pass judgment that we know where it is based. So. What are we, when the president makes a speech, that is, of course, an act of state. So it's in the sphere of state, so that we are clear about the notion. So we talked about the notion of history, or the notion of the state, or the notion of the family, and so on. So we are in the sphere of that notion, because that shows us to what extent something is true, or to some extent what the president does is real, and is real and true, and so on, and a measure which, which the positivist doesn't have. So. When we talk about the state, then the baseline, the basis, is the law, the constitution. When we talk about civil society, the basis is the need system. When we talk about the family, the basis is the is love. So, if we would say civil society has to uh, rest on love, that would not be uh, adequate, and we would be very disappointed. Also, the state does not rest on love; it rests on on obedience to, to the law, to the Constitution. So, therefore, we have to judge the President, whatever he does, uh, by the American Constitution. And the tone strikes, as one can see, are not constitutional. Uh, that he is not open, there we have the Snowden you know, case and the others. One has committed suicide, the other one has been sentenced for decades in prison, and Snowden is in exile. Um, the transparency uh, was part, is part of the Constitution. It's part of the bourgeois enlightenment. In their fight against the feudal lords, they said we will not have secret policies anymore, we will be open to our people and so on. And so this fourth youth movement of Snowden and so on, they remind the bourgeoisie of this original promise. They are on the constitutional side. To hide things before and from the people, that is anti-constitutional that uh, contradicts the whole spirit of the bourgeois enlightenment. Uh, so, and, and that is a, he hasn't settled that with the Snowden case, and he didn't mention it at all, so they gave, uh, they, they, they allowed Snowden to stay in Moscow, which is a very nice thing, they're on the right track by doing that. So, okay, so um, also um, there is such a thing like the Monroe Doctrine, and the president knows, of course, what the Monroe Doctrine is. That means the, the Americas are our influence sphere. What Putin has set up is a Slavic Monroe Doctrine. That means the others have no right to interfere. If we follow the golden rule, uh, you know, do, don't do to other people what you don't want to do to them, that, like we don't want the Monroe Doctrine to be violated. And when the Russians came to Cuba, or when the Russians go to Venezuela, or whatever, we are horribly upset, and we try <coughs> everything to throw them out. Now we have to be clear that this is valid for other people as well. So there is the American world, there's the old European world, which is sinking into the background, 
and there is the Slavic world which is new as we are. We haven't had much history, we have therefore a great evolutionary potential in ourselves and we are the front runners at this time. If they annihilate each other, then the whole human species will be pulled into the abyss and into a stone age. So it is important that these two words, which will not go away, and we cannot degrade them and can say, well, that's a regional power, or it's not a world power, just a regional power, or their, their national product is not more than that of Turkey, and all this is absolute nonsense. The potential is enormous. It reaches from Poland to Vladivostok. That's as big as the two Americas are. And if they push them in the West, they will ally themselves with China on the other side, and with Asia, and, and so on, which is a huge type of thing in terms of investment and productivity. It's unlimited. So, therefore, the, uh, this was somehow missing. I don't think that, uh, I think the president thought, well, he had no reason to think of the mono doctrine because nothing is challenged here at the moment, but that he would grant the mono doctrine also to the Slavic words, and that the same is true because of the equality, the equality that was missing in the whole thing. I wonder who wrote that speech, you know. It was very simple, you know, almost childlike uh, presentation of uh, of liberalism. Okay, so that was about it, and uh, but that was what we just did was a time diagnosis, right, or a content analysis. That's what it's called. So, with the critical theory, there come some concepts like time diagnosis. Uh, they're older than the critical theory. They come already from idealism. Okay, that is very important now, that the Gödinger theory is deeply rooted still in German idealism. But so are others, you know, Mead, for instance, whom you know in, in the sociology department. Mead is uh, based in Kant, right? And so it's Peirce. Peirce is based in Kant. So we have uh, uh, Parsons. Parsons is based in Kant and in Hegel. And so so uh, all our social scientists, here have to are based in that. So, and I cannot uh, impress you enough with this now, right? That there is no theory present in the social sciences which cannot be traced back to one or the other of these idealists. So, uh, Schelling, for instance, you know, is the father of Habermas. Habermas wrote his dissertation on Schelling. Uh, Tillich, Paul Tillich, you know, wrote his dissertation on Schelling. Others, you know, follow Fichte, others follow Kant, others follow Hegel, or follow all of them. So, if, if you say that Chichek fellow there, and maybe we have another seminar next year about that, um, Chichek, you can understand Chichek when you see, you know, what, what, where he comes from, and that is Hegel to a large extent more than Kant, and then Freud or Lacan, and, you know, the connection with Freud and Marx. So, like from combined Marx and Freud. So does uh, Chichek too, and, uh, and, and Marcuse too, and so on. So, but um, whenever you Hannes or, or Habermas or Chichek or whatever, they all know their Hegel. Uh, now what they do with him is another question. So we just see, that, you know, with the president's idealism there, that is a piece of Hegel, and, and but the other presidents have that too. It is just in our bloodstream here, so that's part of our heritage. What makes it maybe so childlike, and, and uh, Hegel would have said shallow, <laughs> they called everybody shallow, so the, that is that it was not dialectical. That means the president is not a dialectician. So <laughs> the right has emphasized the content of idealism. The left has emphasized the method of idealism. So because the content may be very conservative, it is only when you uh, add the dialectics to it and you see everything in motion, like Heraclitus. Hegel is the Heraclitus of the 19th century. So everything, everything flows. Pantare, everything flows. And then also uh, Polymos, Panter, Pantone. That means the war is the father of all things, so conflict. It must not be, you know, war uh, immediate sense, or so it can be any kind of a conflict without which uh, nothing happens. So, um, so there, I mean, 
when we talk about the Slavic and the American world, there may very well be competition between them. And there should be competition, you know. Who uh, has more solidarity? And also who has more personal autonomy? And who gets it together best? That would be a wonderful competition. Now, if it becomes a duel, you know, and we, we want to put our rockets back again into Poland or into the Czech Republic or whatever, this is all unfair and fruitful type of thing and a waste of time and, and utterly dangerous and so, and so um, I mean you see now when Hegel says you know that you can see what Providence does you know in the daily newspaper uh, on a daily television and daily radio that is uh, that would be part of this type of a, of a um, philosophy of history now we know Habermas has rejected this right the uh, philosophy of history um, not the others uh, and um, so should one keep it or not but he has replaced it Habermas has replaced it by a theory of evolution which he got from Parsons you know the Parsons a great American sociologist and, and should be recognized as that so um, Parsons studied in Germany, he studied in Heidelberg he danced with the girls and the girls in Heidelberg said why are you here and he said I want to study the sciences and the girl said to him, don't you have any sciences in America? <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't know exactly what to say, but um, he went back. It, it somehow got stuck in his brain, he went back, and then uh, he was a biologist, really. And then he tried to, out of biology, to develop a, a universal type of a social theory, too big. I mean, not, not so big as Hegel and Fichte and so on, but a middle-range type of a theory instead of just the hypotheses which people operate daily in the departments or so, but a middle, middle range uh, theory he wanted to create. And he used, you know, fundamental categories from biology in order to do that, uh, namely adaptation, an organism has to adapt, uh, an organism has to do pattern maintenance, has to maintain its pattern, uh, an organism has to integrate itself, and adapt and goal attainment has to uh, to uh, aim at certain goals and so on. So these are the categories like it. And he um, uh, devoted his whole time to system building. So he created an unbelievable system together with Merton and so on. And um, uh, so that was an immense type of work. And today when sociologists say, oh, Parsons way behind, you know, Parsons is not good, whatever, that is stupid stuff. One has to learn from him because he was at Harvard, he was a shy little man uh, and, uh, you know, not ostentatious or whatever. He was also a friend of Tillich and he still has Tillich's ultimate reality in his system. But what did him in was the youth movement. The youth movement said, where is your theory of uh, evolution or where is your theory of history? And he didn't have any. And so he was flexible enough and he produced one. So. Uh, Neo Darwin one, Spencer one. Spencer had caught dust there. I told you that story. I went to the cemetery with the Cairn in London and we looked at Marx and I st stood there on, on the grass and I looked at the the monument there of, of Marx's, Marx's monument, Unite, Workers of the World, Unite, and so on. <coughs> and there came an American visitor. Nobody else was there. And he looked at me and he said, Do you know where you're standing? <laughs> I don't know where I'm standing. <laughs> He said, you're standing on Spencer's grace. <laughs> I said, poor Spencer, up to 1900, he was completely forgotten. Why? Why? You always have to ask, you know, about the uh, reality, why these things happen, because the bourgeoisie was unbelievable optimistic. As simple as the Titanic. They wanted to build a ship which would never sink. And that was that shock when that thing ran into an iceberg and so on. So that was triumphant, and they called it Titanic, the name already. The Titans rebelled against the gods, you see, and liberated themselves and so on. So that was a wonderful impression. Where the third estate, after they had guillotined the, the, the aristocracy and the clergy and so on, where they wanted to go, because they were all shopkeepers and carpenters and whatever. And so now they build these unbelievable skyscrapers and these immense ships, <coughs> which, by the way, even today, they're just... Fall, fall in pieces. They sometimes sink at the Italian coast or whatever, and then now the plane got lost there. This is something very f terrible for the third estate. You know, it's something.
something like that happened. Because the Indian Ocean should be under control, that damn thing. And then this guy flies there all the way for six hours uh, down into the Indian Ocean. And so, so these are. Uh, yeah. I, I read an interesting article, and I was actually I was trying to find it for, yeah. for the exam write up, but we're talking about how we've we really much become very much become desensitized to reality yeah. in the modern day, you know, because we you're able to find the information whenever you want it, right? right. You know, yeah. Where what's going on right now, and then you know. But right. with something like this, where it, it enters into that realm of you know it's a yeah. huge ocean, and then it's difficult to find things right. there. Yeah. But it, it troubles us so much that we're it not able to know. Troubles us terribly, yeah. But that you know that came about the first time, not not recently, right. but <coughs> with Niger 14, you know, the First World War. People went triumphantly into this, and then they motorized it and had tanks. And the president, by the way, mentioned that too, the gas war, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't mention Fritz Haber, who did it all. That would be bad for Israel. <laughs> <laughs> he left it out. So it's interesting what he leaves out, you know. It's, it, it, I mean, the more one studies the critical theory, the more critical you become and the more loving you become too, because there's something childlike in all that, you know, what is left out. What is put in. So it was that Fritz Haber there who, um, who had this. Uh, I mean, what he meant was Uppen, 1915 in August. Uh, he mentioned that soldiers were poisoned and so on. <coughs> and then, but he didn't mention that the God forsaken Rumsfeld took that gas and gave it to Saddam Hussein against the Iranians. And so, so there it was completely missing again, you know. And that Rumsfeld, instead of dying peacefully, he is up all the time. He danced around again and mm -hmm. said recently that the president was a trained monkey, <coughs> or that his foreign policy be better done by a trained monkey. That was yes. I mean, they have something with monkeys in South, um, you know, uh, African Americans and monkeys, and so the second time. So <laughs> no less that uh, you know this gas thing was another thing which we should remember there. Okay, so what else do we have? Um, now, uh, is there any comment which you want to make what we, what we did so far? We want to move a little bit. Let me see what we wanted to do. Okay, contemporary issues, so the President's uh, speech there. I have something else here, and I just want to go through that, uh, that uh, you know, we don't have to pick it up. So <coughs> one thing is about Heidegger. I think you gave it to me, right? Um, the uh, the on, black on books. Right, right, uh, yeah. The black notebooks. Being black published. notebooks. There, yeah. Do you know something about it? Uh, you haven't read it, right? No, it's, no. it's not out yet. It's oh. in France right now. The editor is working on it in France, but yeah. it, it it's his own personal notes that he took yeah. during that period of of the war and the fascist period. Yeah. Uh, right. Where it clearly shows he knew what he was doing. Right. You know, in terms of his anti-Semitism yeah. and. After the war, he, uh, you know, said he sent flowers to Mrs. Husserl, <laughs> and they were on the <coughs> island in the North Sea. But he uh, behaved badly toward Husserl, who was his teacher. He was not his doctor father; he had another doctor father. And we said Rana went to his real doctor father, and uh, he rejected him. Rana mm -hmm. um, didn't uh, take his dissertation, and so which uh, happened. So, so, but Heidegger is somebody you know. Who he is. <laughs> Adorno, you know, I told you already, ended every speech with quoting the Romans. And Sato has sent the old Carthaginem de Lendam as a... That means, in general, I think that cottage has to be destroyed, and instead of cottage, he put Heidegger in there. And there was one thing, one thing we discussed with Eugen Kogon, who was a Jew who converted to Catholicism and spent seven years in Buchenwald, and they discussed reason and uh, reason and faith in the University of Münster there. And uh, they, the end came, and then Dirks and Kogon said, now, Mr. Adorno, could we maybe end this in a different way? <laughs> Instead of destroying, destroying the Heidegger again. So, um, but the, um, the Frankfurt School people, you know, when it was ambiguous, so... Uh, there, Adorno didn't see anything good in Heidegger, but Marcuse uh, studied under him, was rejected. Heidegger did not let him promote under him, he did it in Frankfurt instead. But Marcuse returned to him later on and somehow <coughs> forgave him or whatever, and then even wrote a book toward the end of his life, Heidegger and Marxism and so on, the 
I wrote one big book on Hegel and another book on, on Heidegger. So um, that shows us that our attitude should be dialectical. In that sense, we never say, you know, Heidegger is nothing, or I hate him, or whatever, but that we see that there are um, progressive elements in Heidegger, and particularly in his analysis of technology and so on, and that they had in common with the Frankfurt School people, like from talked about in humanistic uh, technology and, and so on. So I thought about Heidegger, the American prejudice, you know, that uh, one has to separate the political position of the person from his worldview, that does not really go, because the worldview, uh, you know, penetrates the whole uh, philosophy, even to the abstract elements of being, because when, you, when Heidegger talks about being and beings, and he wants to rescue being from beings, that being also legitimate these beings. And the beings, that is what is the case in society. And that is the alliance between this type of a philosophy and positivism. And Hitler would have been and have become the greatest positivist if they had not lost the war. So um, that, uh, um, as far as Heidegger is concerned, so but at least maybe not Adorno, but the others. Uh, uh, <coughs> Ockheimer heard him. Ockheimer went to his lectures so in, in Freiburg. Not Freiburg in Switzerland, but Freiburg in this Black Forest. Um, so there were some connections with them. And uh, But their students and Heidegger students, they fought, you know, through the 60s and 70s, and it went into historian struggle, and... Uh, to um, you know, to assess fascism in a different way, by saying that Hitler's brutality was only the response to Stalin's brutality, and thereby to equalize things and so on. And Habermas then uh, fought against them, and he won the battle about how they, they didn't come through with their uh, with their attempt to normalize fascism in a certain sense. <laughs> okay, then we have something there about the holy and the unholy, um, and that has something to do with the uh, with the religion and Roman Catholicism, and with the Vatican, and there is a lot of things coming out. There is a Deshna. It's unbelievable the waves of hate which there are to call people to leave the Catholic Church and so on. It is not only the child abuse case and, and the corruption in the Vatican and so on. But um, the uh, the Pope before uh, Pius the Twelfth, or well, let's put it that way, people, conservative people think that what happened from John the Twenty Third on was a mistake in the Council and so on, and therefore they elevate Pius the Twelfth and they want to make him into a saint and so on. So, and what um, what the opponents say is that Pius the Twelfth. Uh, you know, made of course was Pacelli before, and he was the nuncius in Berlin, and he um, developed this uh, Vatican Treaty with Mussolini, and then also with Hitler, and the whole alliance against fascism, and he was a very ascetic person, and he spoke German, and when I grew up in the Catholic Youth Movement, he was always glorified in terms of personality, cult, much he loved the Germans and, and so on, and he worked all night long. How did we know? Because his light was on always in his office. So um, it was a strange type of thing. So, but we have to know how that, uh, you know, what that has to do with this struggle. Now, the critical theorists had a strange relationship, and a sort of basic thing happened. Namely, in the 60s, the capitalists put their working class on the pill since that time all the people of the pill and that led to um, to the situation where everybody had 2.1 children that was the ideal uh, now recently they, they complained bitterly that the population is aging well of course when they put them on the pill they will be aging sometimes they think they are just absolutely stupid or what what the hell did they expect did they think the pill makes them all younger or what so now they don't know who, who is supposed to take care of that aging population because the others are only come with 2.1% and that's not enough because there are thousands of people dying every day and therefore thousands of them have to be born. Otherwise it gets a little bit unbalanced. So 
And uh, but at that time, then the, the Pope had put up a committee who talked about Malthusianism. That is the theory. I guess that's known to all of us. Right? Malthus was a social scientist. He was also an Anglican priest, and he established that rule that the population increases two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on, and the food supply is one, two, three, four, five. Which, after Fritz Haber, is not true anymore, because Fritz Haber got ammoniac out of the air and doubled the food supply, and so on. So, but that doesn't prevent people from uh, going on believing in the Malthusian uh, situation. So. Malthus himself was not married at the time yet. He married and four children later himself. He went beyond the 2.1 there. So, um, But he um, told people to live a chaste life. So after they had their two children, then they were not to have sex any longer or whatever he thought. Marx made unbelievable fun of, of him and uh, laughed about him. And uh, but uh, uh, Marx had another oppositional theory, and you know that, namely the social Darwinistic one. The more uh, things are eaten in the process, and everybody eats everybody in nature, uh, it's a very tragic uh, nature. So um, the more people are eaten, the more they have to procreate. So the, the cats eat so many mice, therefore the mouse has to have a baby every uh, month. And so so um, and the uh, elephant, of course, he has uh, young ones, maybe after two years or ten years or whatever, uh, because uh, nobody eats him. So, and so therefore, when you are in the slums, the, your life expectancy is much lower, and therefore you are oversexed, and therefore you have more children in the slums than you have in, on the rich side, you know, where, where people may not get married at all. Many of the capitalists here were not married at all, like Eastman, for instance, in Rochester. Uh, um, who was a saint in his community. They all loved him, and he did only one bad thing. He came home from an elephant uh, hunting, and, um, and, and uh, they diagnosed him that he had brain cancer. So he had a big party for everybody and went out of the veranda. They had a beautiful house there in Rochester, opposite of my relatives there, and, uh, and there he shot himself. So uh, he shouldn't have done that, but People gave it to him because of the industry he developed and, and so on. So, so no, in, in Cleveland uh, there was a group of believers who lived in celibacy and they didn't marry. I don't know what their names were anymore, but there was a whole area of Cleveland in which they lived there and died slowly and the houses were empty. So, Okay, so uh, nevertheless, then the church had to take a position. Now th this... Uh, Malthusianism could now be realized be, not by morality but by technology, um, by chemistry. So, and John the, John the 23rd set up a committee, and then uh, the committee was 2.1 percent that Catholics should accept this Malthusianism too. But then came Paul the Sixth, and he wrote the encyclical letter Humani Vitae, Human Life, in which he uh, prescribed again the old method which they had taught for 2,000 years. And uh, that produced a horrible crisis. But in that crisis, now, Horkheimer took the side of the uh, uh, of the Pope, and that irritated tremendously the left in Europe, but also the positivists. Both of them were horribly upset. So, um, but the uh, Horkheimer was not for uh, against birth control um, out of theological reasons like the Pope, uh, God has set all that up rationally and purposefully and birth control was a violation of this teleology. So, but he was, uh, Alkheimer was of course like from a uh, combination of Marx and Freud and so he took a Freudian argument, namely um, that we have a fundamental biological uh, um, sexual drive, that means the it, the will to life, has a, a libidinous component and an aggressive component, but this libidinous component has to be transformed <laughs> into love, uh, into human love, and that is done by a taboo. So whatever, whenever you taboo it, and you find all the most primitive tribes, and so on, that an unbelievable regulation of sexual behavior for instance, totemism, that you cannot uh, marry the people who belong to the same totem, or you can only marry the people who belong to the same totem, but nobody outside, no exogamy, only endogamy, and so on. So, um, uh, that uh, these taboos then, and, and uh, f uh, to have uh, birth control removes the taboo of, for instance, being afraid to become pregnant. Uh, that function as a taboo, and if you have birth control, you remove that taboo. So uh, only when you t 
taboo the sexual drive, then it turns into other things, into productive things like um, mad love or, or become an artist or philosopher or whatever. The libido is transformed into creativity of some kind. And so um, Horkheimer was afraid of the detabuization. So the end of the encyclical is that birth control would lead to uh, uh, would lead to to uh, what is it called? Uh, well, everybody having sex with everybody. Uh, what is that called? Uh, there's a name for Hedonism? that. Hedonism. Hmm? Hedonism. No, no, that could be part of it. Yeah, but uh, well, what, whatever. So. Polygamy. Hmm. No, there's a word for it. Fun. Oh. <laughs> Orgy. No. No. no, no, no. <laughs> That's what the Pope was afraid of, but polygamy. No, no, no gummy at all. Yeah. Uh, no. So, uh, but but uh, Horkheimer was not. Uh, it's a complete breakdown of marriage or whatever. So all sex is without marriage, and so on, but there's a name for this, nevertheless. Uh, but Horkheimer was a bit more concerned, you know, that all the cultural arrangements which come from these taboos, so great music, uh, great poetry, and so that this would all go in, in down to in the, the bucket there. So that was the fear. Okay, another thing, uh, which contemporary issue, which would be interesting for us is the Nazi scientists. In a certain sense, the um, you know which they took here, so the Soviets took. Uh, have a pain and the Americans took the other one, and that is how Werner von Braun and SS uh, Colonel uh, did uh, took us to the moon, and he would have taken us to Mars if they hadn't stopped him. So, and not he alone, but he had uh, maybe 1,500 or so scientists came with him. <laughs> uh, but in, in certain sense, the um, and we can see that when we look at the literature, they did that with the uh, with the. Uh, um, Goodinger theorists as well, because more and more of them were hired, and there was even the plan that the whole institute should be hired by the State Department or the American government, and they became specialists for socialism, for communism, for fascism, and so on. Neumann was there, Marcuse was there, so um, Hockerman wasn't, but uh, Adorno wasn't either. But so that is how the uh, Marcuse, for instance, uh, uh, felt very hard, uh, it was very bad about leaving. The, uh, the institute at uh, Columbia University, but there was a question of payment. He had a family, had to pay, and the institute couldn't pay enough. They couldn't pay from enough, and so from made himself independent, and others, Neumann and Kirchheimer and so on, they were all hired by the American government in Washington, and that is how they made a living. And Marcuse was sad, very emotional about it. He said, I, I want to work in the institute, but I just can't afford it and uh, recommended that uh, the whole institute should be uh, instrumentalized for, for government for the war efforts. And and, uh, and they worked together, and I told you that, uh, with uh, Mrs. Roosevelt particularly, who was very active, and uh, they had this idea, and the new school was somehow participating in it too. They competed uh, that not all Germans were Nazi, uh, uh, Morgenthau, the Jews thought they were all Nazis, they should be all castrated and Germany should be made into farmland, that was the alternative. But they thought, you know, that not all Germans were fascists and particularly the prisoners of war here are 300,000, so they chose 25,000 anti-Nazis and that was one of them, and educated them and sent them back in order to move from fascism into liberalism again where they had come from and I was very active in this thing. So, that is the... so. Um, there is a great difference between liberalism and fascism, but um, the liberals, you know, are playing with the devil. Sometimes when it is useful, they are very pragmatic and so on. And uh, of course, they also allied themselves with the communists against the fascists and so on. So the liberal is some kind of a chameleon who can change his colors if it uh, fits his interest and so on. So. Uh, nobody could foresee that they would, uh, didn't foresee, I think, that they would ally themselves with 
with the Soviet Union against uh, against fascism or whatever, but they did. And then they used the fascists again in order to uh, get their science moving. And, and Patton already trained in Austria. He trained as Esmond to march back with them to uh, to uh, Stalingrad. And uh, the Congress it came before Congress, so the Congress was tired of war. They didn't want to expand it anymore. Otherwise, he would have marched back again all the way. <laughs> okay, then what else do we have here? Um, yeah, there is the issue there, this ex-pope there, Benedict, you know, if he was forced out of office. I talked with the press here, and they wrote up in the newspaper about it. Um, so that is a un very unusual thing, and it's a very tragic figure in a certain sense. And he sits in the Vatican now, uh, so like a little monk and, uh, in the side building there, and uh, he walks around in his white coat, which he is not supposed to wear anymore, mm -hmm. or only the Pope can wear it, and he said he didn't have anything else. <laughs> it's just, uh, just a very sad type of a story. But uh, So there, there was the charge that he had been forced out because of the corruption in the Vatican, the banking system, and also because of homosexual situation among his closest assistants in the Vatican, and that forced him out. Well, he said he had not been forced out. So the first theory is he was the old, and but all of the other popes were old too, but they stayed. The Germans are very critical of his departure because they said, you cannot get down from the cross. You tell the mad people who are not happily mad that they should uh, stay in their marriage and so on, but you left it, you left your office and so on. So they are very upset. So I don't think it was only the old age. I don't think it were the scandals uh, alone, but something else, something a little bit more complicated. With the Second Vatican Council, the paradigm, the scholastic paradigm collapsed. The Germans followed, uh, the uh, Catholics followed step by step Thomas Aquinas, a great thinker who rescued Christianity from Islam in the, in the 12th, 13th century. And um, so he was their man, and he was a very progressive thinker. He was even on the list of heretics for a little while, and that helped. And then they uh, developed the neo-scholasticism, and here the, in Toronto, their Maritain and so on, where these neo-scholastics, and there in the 40s, 50s, and so on, there was a big movement. And the last vestigials of that is our medieval institute, which is connected with the Toronto uh, enterprise. So that was neo-scholasticism, but it didn't work. By, um, by the 60s, then, when the council started, the Catholic Church couldn't deal with that anymore. I know still in um, St. Georgen in Frankfurt, they still talk Latin, in the seminars and had to learn it all by heart in Latin, this type of neo-scholasticism. And this fellow there, the now the, the Pope, he was in St. Georgen there, he studied there, so he still got that. But then it all fell apart. <coughs> and then this huge apparatus had no philosophy anymore. And I think they took him in because his hold were not the scholastics, but those before, and these are the church fathers, the Greek Church Fathers, Originus, who is the father of the Orthodox Catholics in the Ukraine and so on. And then uh, Augustine, of course, the father from Catholicism. Um, and uh, they thought that this could maybe replace scholasticism. And then I think the old man found out that it works as little as did scholasticism. The Church Fathers were enlighteners in the Roman Empire. That means they were Hellenistically trained. Augustine knew everything about uh, mythology and whatever, Roman, Greek and everything. And so the same is true with Origenes and so on. So they were, uh, uh, when, when they, as far as the uh, celibacy is concerned, it wasn't the law of the Church at that time, but they were for it already and they gave reasons for it and so on. So, um, reasons which also Plato would give, or the Neoplatonists, and so on. So, but the enlightenment in antiquity and the enlightenment today, that is a very, very uh, great difference. So the enlightenment is carried by the third estate of very practical, technical people, technical nationalities. Suddenly they have airplanes and they have cars which are not drawn by horses anymore, and so on. So they really revolutionize.
revolutionize the world and this type of functional science became tremendously productive and, and innovative and, and so on. And so that there's no comparison to uh, science in, in the Roman Empire or whatever. So <laughs> this is why this modern split occurred between reason and faith. It's, uh, it's faith and a particular form of reason which was very productive. So um, that means the church became de-Hellenized in the Reformation. The Reformation de-Hellenized, Luther was a nominalist, so Aristotle was rejected and Plato was rejected and uh, Protestantism would not have come about if that had not happened. Then came the uh, natural science revolution in the 17th century uh, that would not have come about without getting rid of Aristotle's natural science. And, uh, and then the uh, French Revolution, that is also nominalistic, it is also uh, de-Hellenized, and then the culturalism is also de-Hellenized, and um, the Pope uh, thought that this de-Hellenization would make out of Christianity just a little story for simple naive people and uh, the great classical Christology and so on, this all would, would collapse, and so he fought the Habermas and, and the Pope, they discussed this, the Hellenization thing, and while well, the Pope uh, talked about the costs of this de Hellenization, Habermas emphasized the advantages of it, that we would have never had this great natural science without de Hellenization, we would never have had the bourgeois revolution without the de Hellenization, and uh, uh, not the Reformation, and all without the Reformation, we wouldn't have the modern state. If the Reformation had not destroyed the Western Church, the state could never have developed this state which we have here, which is secular, which doesn't need any legitimate, uh, uh, religious uh, legitimation anymore. So, and all these are great advances, and uh, Habermas thought they were worth it, uh, the sacrifice of the Hellenization. And uh, so the Pope then made an outright attack. <laughs> on modernity, but it was not based on scholasticism anymore, and it couldn't be based on the church fathers anymore, so he was hanging there, he was lost. The university in Rome uh, did, uh, did not invite him because he said the Inquisition may have been right anyway against Galileo, and uh, the other one had said to Pope before, had said, you know, the Inquisition may have made a mistake, and Rasmus said, no, they didn't make a mistake because he himself was the last inquisitor now, and he didn't want to say that the monks at that time were thinking the wrong way and, and so on. So, so that is his tragedy, I think, and that is what I defended him. And the bishop said, no, he was just old. Well, of course, he was old, so he is right too, and I'm right too. <laughs> we're both right. He was just old and broken, and nothing worked anymore. And now this one goes back to the Gospels now. By the way, another thing about the speech today, the president <laughs> left Brussels and went to Rome, Rome. and he will visit, visit the Pope there too, yeah. <coughs> now, that is a good thing, of course, you know, to go back to the Gospels, and the Gospels were written by poor people, not by middle class people, and we'll see how far that goes now, right? So because uh, when we read from what he has to say about the dogma of Christ, or Reich, Wilhelm Reich, the, the murder of Christ, and so on. We'll see, you know, that Christianity was the religion of the poorest of the poor, but it was later on adopted by the, and transformed by the middle class, and, and by the nobility, and by the patricians, and by the feudal lords, and by the capitalists, and instrumentalized, and so on. And what is left now is a pitiful shadow of its own self, and our Islamic brothers, under no circumstances, want Islam to suffer the same catastrophe which Christianity has suffered, only that we don't even see that Christianity has suffered this catastrophe. So, I think it would be good to make all that clear, then we would understand ourselves better, and we will go tomorrow to the mosque, and whenever we go there, we, we try to make that clear, to <coughs> understand why Islam feels attacked by the third estate and by the bourgeois enlightenment and, and so on. So, um, okay, so that was another then uh, Auschwitz uh, and um, then Jews in the Ukraine. We we mentioned that there, the burning down of the synagogue. Where should we take a break? It's about 10 mm -hmm. after 8 or so. Yeah, we can do that. So, and uh, I just want
want to look at the I, I'm through now about these contemporary issues and then we can go from there and we want to have our movies too right uh, we want to have that movie which you remember back there which we started right Justin, can we do it yep absolutely can you maybe look Walter wrote a script which we have to follow in the film. there yeah <laughs> and the movie is still in it there from last week right I left it there so it would be good to go Uh, right. David, why don't you sit in my chair? Come, sit in my chair. Take <laughs> some cookies and the water and enjoy yourself. I enjoy that chair. I sent an email to Louise. The, the, uh, right, very good. The Franciscan monk uh, professor in Rome to see if we could find a electric wheelchair or something. Yeah, okay. that would be... Yeah, I, mean, I, I walk as much as I can. That and then... Um, I've been emailing back and forth with Rosie about where you might want to visit yeah. in Rome, what places, and things right. like that. So For the time we have, right? Yeah, because you're getting there on Wednesday, I think, and then Thursday is the well, conference. Think we fly in by Tuesday. Tuesday night? So you have Wednesday yeah. and Thursday? Yeah, we go to Zagreb and then to Split, and then to Rome. Okay. We fly all over the place. I'll be there days ahead of you. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm I'll be there from Saturday yeah. to Saturday. Okay. So and then you can always eat with us, you can always drive with us, right? Okay. Make use of this. Right. You're staying quite a bit outside of the city. Really? And I'm staying right in the middle of it. Well, we can always drive in and pass by and pick you up. Or okay. Yeah, you're up in the north, northeast part. Mm -hmm. And I'm right next to the Vatican. Really? So. Okay. I think your hotel has more Yeah, and, and why don't we just meet then in the hotel and have supper together the night I come from? Well, how do you get there? How do you get to my hotel? Uh, I don't know. i got to see if the subway runs that way, because that's oh. the most effective way. Is it way? From where I'm at? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you'd probably be a half hour away from where oh I'm really? at, so going through the oh. city. But then we could eat then. I, I paid for the taxi. You can take a taxi and I paid for you. And we can eat together and right. we can drive back in the taxi. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Don't walk in that place. I don't know how safe it is. I <laughs> I walked around all the time when I was there last really? time. You know, it was no big deal. But, yeah. um, you know, but that's down in the downtown part where everyone is. Yeah. So that's that's where well, really you're, you're not afraid of the mafia, so. No. No. Okay, can we put the movie in? Yes. Yeah. So that it would be ready when we... It's a nice chair, right? It's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Now you push the thing and then you go back. Yeah, I'll just have me right It'll be there. really comfortable. Let's grab these. <coughs> no, I'm not too afraid of the mafia. No. Berlusconi, on the other hand, is a scary human being. Comes with the mafia, and yeah. Hopefully you don't have to do a presentation anymore. No, I don't. Oh, no. I think I'll be okay. I've no, no read every, pretty much every word of all the books this semester, so I'll give myself a slack this time. Cut off all the breaks. This will be the one where you call me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it'll, it'll be the one where it's like, I don't think that's right. Could you point out the exact page? You should leave it a little concerned, we are in the end time now. Um, so, as far as um, books where I talk about Habermas and so on and so on, we mentioned that already. There's Hockham as Critical Sociology of Religion. Um, very simple, the whole book is about two Dioscuri, two uh, pairs of people. One is Kogon and Dex, the other one is uh, Hockham and Adorno. There are two Jews, well one is a Jew, the other one is a half-Jew, Adorno. And Adorno um, was baptized Catholic, educated Protestant, and then became a Marxist. Completely messed up type of a person. <laughs> and grew up in Frankfurt, in my city of Frankfurt. And he could speak the dialect of Frankfurt. I heard him once. It was just ridiculous. And you, you know, usually simple people talk the Frankfurt dialect. 
But when a highly developed diver guy talks about it, this is just outrageous. It, I almost laughed myself into a heart did, attack. Did he spend his childhood in Almsbach or something? Yeah, for vacation. For yeah. vacation, you know. The Old World. I think it's the Old World, or where is it? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Amberbach. Amberbach. Am Amberbach. Yeah, yeah. It's a real medieval Catholic place, by the way. Mm. Uh, that was his paradise. The Heile Welt, that was. <laughs> okay, so, and um, none of them converted. Um, Dirk knew uh, Adorno already before the war. Adorno introduced him into modern music. Adorno studied in Vienna and uh, um, different modern composers, became a composer himself played the, uh, the piano, was a critic of music, and so on, and uh, Dex, they were good friends, and Dex learned all that from him. Dex himself, when I visited him at the end of his life, he had a wonderful piano there, and he played, uh, the, and he learned all that from particularly modern music, and so on. So, um, and, uh, so that, as far as the relationship, um, they wrote things together, Dix and, and Adorno wrote a book for Horkheimer together. Adorno, um, Dix was hired by Adorno into the institute. Adorno also wanted to hire Metz, the father of the uh, uh, liberation theology. Maybe we can have a look at some of that too there. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, Kogon was an Austrian Jew. I knew, didn't know up to a year ago that he was Jewish. I only knew that he was Catholic. They met after the war. Uh, the one came from Buchenwald, the concentration camp near Weimar, and the other one was an internal, this was an internal uh, uh, hiding, internal emigration. He had been in prison, the Nazis put him into prison. Um, he, by the way, did not have his doctorate. He uh, wanted to write his doctorate on Marx the young Marx, and because of the war situation and so on, he never got to it. So he was the assistant of Romano Guardini, who was a famous theologian, but who somehow uh, got along with the Nazis. He was teaching at the University of Berlin, and he was never touched, while others were sent to Buchenwald, and so on. Guardini was always uh, Guardini was a phenomenologist, and the phenomenologists were very much on the fascist side. And um, Hitler was supposed to be the great phenomenologist who also knew the right time to act. That was how he was known to his friends and so on. So, and of course, Husserl, you know about this phenomenology? That is not Hegel's dialectical phenomenology of the mind, but it's an undialectical phenomenology, which should uh, deal with the crisis into which positivism brought science, but it did not really help. It became positivism itself. So we have a book by... Uh, by Adorno on Husserl and Phenomenology. And uh, there is Schulz, what is his name, who was with Parsons, who Schulz, I think, was his name, who was a businessman, who brought Phenomenology to Parsons. And Parsons took some of it into his thinking on the individual level. Okay. So these are the two pairs. Um, the both were controversial. So the uh, Dirks and Kogan were, uh, were controversial in their religious circle. They had a news uh, journal, the Frankfurter Hefte, in which they tried to bring a left-wing Catholicism together with socialism and liberalism and, and so on. And they were, when I came home from the war, there was a, a, a large number of people. When you go up there on the right side, you see them all from 1945 on. I collected them all. And um, so when they became old and retired, they sold it to the Eberhard Stiftung, uh, which is a, a social democratic enterprise, and they gave it to them. Uh, they, they sold it, sold it to left. And now they are called <coughs> New Society Frankfurt Hefte, so it still has the same name. And sometimes they bring still articles about religion, so they keep their promise to the two authors there. They had problems in the end of their life together about the theology problem. Um, Kogon, who had suffered so much in his family and so on, wanted to have a whole number of the Frankfurter Hefte about the Odyssey. And Kogon, Kogon wanted to have it, Dirk opposed it. And Kogon had this opinion that nobody had a right to be happy who had not suffered in the concentration camps. And uh, Dirk was against this. So they fell apart in the 
certain sense, but Kogon, the ex was weeping in the room, and the ex came in and uh, tried to console him, said, well, let's go on working, and they did work together, but um, the theology problem, the alienation of Kogon in terms of religion and God and so on because of his suffering, when he came out of the concentration camps, his five children and the wife were in Vienna and lived in a miserable apartment up under the roof because the archbishop in, um, in, in Vienna was somehow pro-Nazi and therefore Kogon was suspicious and the family lost the faith and when the uh, Kogon came home they wanted to have a good life now, the father was supposed to make money so they could live nicely. He went to Darmstadt in a technical, uh, a technical university and became political scientist there but he didn't make much money. Then he traveled around, he said the mission that fascism would never appear again, would never happen again, and that bound him together with Adorno because they had the same thing. Under no circumstance must liberalism again move over into fascism. That was the reason why I came over here, because we have the suspicion, you know, that it could happen here, what happened in Europe, and so on. So, and that is uh, the purpose of our teaching and writing, and so on, that this will not happen in a speech like this today that is an indicator if it will not happen or will happen or whatever, and certainly it will not happen with this president. He's aware of this and, and so on, but uh, in the long run, the trends which are in, on the neoliberal side are, are very dangerous. Okay, so um, so this, that is what the book is about. So it shows us some of the background of Habermas and the background of Fromm uh, and the context of Fromm and of Hamid and so on. So, that's one thing, and you can choose there, and um, and you can also report on it. You can take it as one of your reports here. And the other one is then the uh, world religions in the public sphere, which is very much, uh, you know, used in Habermas a lot. And uh, then you have also the uh, uh, evolution of the uh, religious consciousness and of the ethical consciousness which also uh, brings, you know, Hanif and Habermas and so on in. Uh, depth study you can choose and uh, you can have from or Habermas or Hanif and then you can make a report about this. All about my books, all about them, all about other books, whatever you choose. And we have you then the next time, yes, the first one, yeah. Okay, let's see, my 10, 15 minutes and then we have a discussion and you can lead the discussion then. Okay, okay very good. Now I want to make a short book review again, as I did the last time, and uh, not in a necessarily order. We have to do it. So I can just put it there. So let me just look at some things here. Here's Axel Honnef, <laughs> and that is the book on the pathology of reason, on the legacy of the critical theory. Um, now that uh, we talked about Honnef, here yeah, he comes over here in Columbia University and so on. His stuff is translated. This is translated. Um, we said that Hannes uh, is, of course, a student of uh, Habermas, and Habermas is a student of Adorno, and now we know all the critical theists are students of the idealists. And uh, I think that even they looked at Marx, you know, as if he was uh, uh, somehow a, a proletarian idealist or something like that. So there has never been a logic, you know, which takes the place of the Hegelian idealistic logic has never been produced, and so on. So, but I'm not so sure. I just read it once that Horkheimer talks about proletarian idealism, but I don't know if that became a real concept or not, so we have to be careful with this. We know that Fromm also wrote something on the pathology of, uh, of normalcy, uh, which is the same thing then. And So, um, as far as uh, Hegel is concerned, uh, Habermas started, as we saw, to go to the human potentials of language and memory, which he got from Hegel and from Kant, and then went around Hegel's system. Hegel's system is built on that, but instead of systematizing it, he took the dialectics of language and so on <coughs> and built his whole philosophy on this. So that's Habermas. But he also included already another human potential, and that was the struggle for recognition. The struggle for recognition was there in, in the early writings of Hegel, but also in the phenomenology. There is a chapter on master and servant, and master and servant are fighting with each other to death. So, so uh, the, the capitalist or the feudal lord or whatever, because he does not work, he becomes more and more undeveloped and weaker and weaker. 
while the worker, by doing the hard work and disciplining himself, becomes stronger and stronger, and then comes the time where the servant overthrows the master. So it represents, you know, what the bourgeoisie really did, but it also shows what may happen to the bourgeoisie, and it, this book, uh, Phenomenology, became uh, very important uh, for Marx. It was, for them, the story of the evolution of human labor, uh, the whole book, and, and Brecht read it up to the end of his life uh, and, and wanted to be buried besides Hegel, and he was buried opposite to Hegel, because besides Hegel there is his wife buried, so Brecht was buried in the opposite uh, little pathway, and then it's opposite together with his wife there. Okay, so that is where it comes from then. That means uh, the key, now it's not so much language, he leaves that to Habermas, but it is the struggle for recognition. Struggle for recognition, or the opposite of uh, opposition, is the opposite is uh, humiliation. So um, if you are in the lower classes, you not only don't have a job, you don't have any money, you are not wealthy and so on, but you are also nothing. And there is, in the early Christianity, you know, where Paul says, and those who are nothing will undo those who are something, and so on. That is a very revolutionary type of formula. But to not to be recognized, never to have his pictures in the, in the newspaper or whatever, and to drive your bus there, and nobody knows that you drive a bus, and it's hard in winter and all that, and nobody appreciates it, and so on. And there are millions and millions of those people, so... Whom those whom we call the working hard, working poor, are not only those who don't have uh, enough uh, to fulfill their needs, but they also are not recognized in their work, in their job, and all what they do, and so on, which makes them angry very often. And this anger is filtered then by these popular right wing radio stations and, and uh, television stations, and so on, like Fox, and so on. Okay, so that is Axel Honneth there. Uh, there is another book here which I wanted to show you. Unfortunately, it's not translated. So, uh, but that is by Fetcher, who is a German Marxist, and Alfred Schmidt, who was a student of Horkheimer on the same generation of Habermas. And these two edited something. And the title of the book is Emancipation as Reconciliation. We saw the Horkheimer's uh, Utopia, Alternative Future Number Three. You have it on the roadmap uh, there on the D. Um, that uh, is uh, the, that is the goal to which they really wanted to come, a society in which the antagonisms which you have on the road map under D, um, there are 50 or whatever antagonisms, so uh, the solution of these antagonisms would slowly lead us to alternative future number three, the reconciled society. So that means emancipation or liberation is understood as reconciliation. That means we would become free only if these antagonisms would be reconciled. That means each antagonism is a form of alienation. We would become free only if this alienation would be negated. Now they became more pessimistic with Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and so on because the workers did not do what Marx did. They followed Hitler and Mussolini and Franco and Salazar instead of taking their masters out and guillotining them and preventing the Second World War. They went along with it. And so that was the great disappointment. And therefore, the idea that alternative future number one was really happening, the totally administered society, imaged in terms of the skyscrapers and nine lanes going into Toronto. <coughs> and completely anonymous, nobody knows who sits in those cars, and they are only regulated by signals, red light, green light, and so on. So they call it also the signal society, the bureaucratic society, and so on. And Adorno thought we were in it already, Horkheimer was we were close to it, and maybe we could modify it. Um, it was not entirely bad, the alienation would be greater, but there would also be justice, uh, the, there would not be so many people without any health insurance, without any housing, or without any clothing, or without any education, and without any health care, and so on, as we have it now. If the engineers would take over, and if it would become a totally technocratic society, robotized society, signal society, and so on. So, now, uh, this is about uh, the Adorno's critique of the um, uh, uh, commodity 
Commodity Exchange Society. So there is the question, you know, how to define in sociology, how to define the present society in which we are. Um, Marx, the first chapter of the Capital, deals with commodities. Um, Marx talks about commodity fetishism, that means the commodities are idolized, like the idols of which the prophets speak. They have eyes and can see, have ears and cannot hear, they have legs and cannot walk. Uh, and so we also we idealize our own products, our own machines, and our own commodities, and so on. So they define, uh, Adorno and the Corinthians define uh, uh, our society, civil society, as a commodity exchange society on the highest level possible. What happens with the commodities? Commodity is compared with another commodity. There is an equivalence. So that means you compare... Uh, a pound of butter, let's see, for which you work six hours with another guy who sells you shoes who also worked for six hours. So the commodities are compared with what they have in common. What they have common is a certain amount of labor hours. That constitutes their value. And um, so therefore there is uh, a certain... Uh, <laughs> the commodities uh, generalize things. Commodities deprive things of their otherness and that has happened to the Jews the Jews were persecuted because they were different the homosexuals are different that's why they were put in the concentration camps whatever is different has to make equal has to make the same the society number one is the society of sameness like when I discussed with the federal government, they talked about average people. Only the average people are real. Extraordinary people do something special or whatever, they don't know exactly what to do with it. So that goes all back, this a commodity thing, uh, you know, becomes a symbol for what will happen in the, uh, in the uh, alternative future number one. The mowing down of difference, of special, of uh, being special, being extraordinary, or whatever. And, of course, there was a time, you know, when there was no commodity exchange. Commodity is a thing, not, not when, when you bake bread in your, in your family. That's not a commodity. When you have more bread than you can eat, and you go into the marketplace and you sell it, at that moment it becomes a commodity, and then you exchange it. And you have to exchange it on the basis of equivalence. That means... You have to exchange it against the same thing in another commodity. And it's not the <coughs> difference between the two which counts, but the lack of difference because of which the exchange process can take place. And uh, so when the capitalism doesn't work right, then we return to barter again, where you exchange, you can't just sold a car, and that was done with money, and so on. But you could also say, well, we give that car, and you give me a grass mower or whatever it is car is gone, it uh, has no value anymore, it's not more value than a grass mower and so on, so you see what the both have in common, and that's what makes them different, and that has social consequences, sociological consequences, that means that everything in society, what is different, has to be subordinated to a common type of a standard, and uh, otherwise the whole thing doesn't function. So. That is in the perspective of transformation. So Adorno and all the other critics, Habermas and so on, they want to transform this commodity society into another one in which sameness and difference would be mediated with each other. Or better, where personal autonomy would not go under, but personal commodity uh, autonomy would be uh, 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 somehow mediated with uh, um, solidarity. Uh, and that these two things would be reconciled. That's what we mentioned all the time in philosophy of history with the Eastern and uh, the Western world and uh, Russia and, and America and so on, that this is what they have to accomplish when we take this philosophy serious. Uh, they have to accomplish this reconciliation. And uh, when we see, you know, how, how this is violated here, this solidarity, uh, if we don't have uh, minimum wage, uh, then that's a lack of solidarity. Or if we don't have uh, unemployment compensation, that's violation of solidarity. So we violate it massively. So we have an unbelievable lack of solidarity. And this negative.
activity which drives the society beyond itself. No matter if it's a bomb or whatever, it's a, it pushes by its own inner dynamic beyond itself, as the feudal lords did, as the slaveholders did, and so on. So, but that this is not a natural process, but becomes a process of which we are conscious and to which we give direction, that is important, because otherwise it will become so violent as a tornado or a hurricane or, or whatever, so and nobody will count anymore if there's a good capitalist or bad capitalist, or if he gave 100 billion for the, the medical school or not, they will all be guillotined. That means they will all be made equal by cutting their heads off. So, so therefore, the transformation is in direction of alternative future number three, uh, in terms of a free society and freedom is the lack of alienation because of reconciliation. Now here's a new thing which uh, uh, Dustin gave me, Slavoj Cicek, he is from uh, Slovenia. <coughs> Slovenia was one of the uh, uh, one of the states of the Yugoslavia. It's a Catholic country, it is close to Austria and is very much western oriented and now he uh, collected uh, jokes his own joke and I want to show you how idiotic these jokes are I just want to read one of them to you um, he is an absolute neurotic that means he, he is his face there he looks like Rasputin and when he is on television <laughs> <laughs> he cannot hold himself his arms are shivering and his legs are all over the place uh, but he is an intelligent guy but um, what, uh, and he wants to speak to the present situation, and certain Habermas has that too. They want to enter the public sphere, and there is a great danger now. What is the danger that they become journalists? Right? So um, that means journalism takes over, and thought moves into the background. That is very, very sad. So um, let me see where it is. Oh yeah, here yeah, just one. Joke. I don't want to bother you with all the jokes there. They are, <laughs> <laughs> they're hilarious. They are hilarious. They're hilarious. And a lot of about Hegel. Okay, here's one there. <laughs> the fun many of them are sexy too. The function of repetition is best exemplified by an old joke from socialist times about a Yugoslav politician on a visit to Germany. When his train passes, a city, he asked his guide, what city is this? The guide replies, Baden, Baden. The politician snaps back, I'm not an idiot. You don't have to tell me twice. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> a city is Baden, Baden. So, but both names together, so he thinks he doubled it up because he's stupid. So, okay, that, that is, uh, it's a very good thing there, so I, I like it. Okay, now here is something about social interaction and social understanding. So that is very sociological and interesting for you. It is edited by Jürgen Habermas, and you have all kinds of people who have um, contributed to that. So that means we said they depend on idealism, but what they want to do is to translate idealism into a theory of human action and interaction. So the question was how to practice idealism, because the idealists themselves didn't give us enough answer to that. So um, Hegel said we have solved the problem about reason and freedom and so on, but as far as the masses in civil society is concerned, they are hopeless. They have to see how they can get along with this thing. So they have to be deprived of all the mythology. Uh, the society rests now on science. They cannot express their higher feelings anymore, their longings and so on, but I have no idea what, how to do, what to do about this, because they are picture thinking, the masses cannot think, so, and the pictures are gone, the mythology is gone. Now, all what I have to offer is thinking, notion thinking, but they cannot think, so what should I do? Now, that is the question, now maybe not so much with religion, but in other areas, how should the good things, uh, 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 um, the discovery of human subjectivity, the infinite value of of man and so on as we have it in uh, Fichte and so on, how is that to be realized now in real society so therefore Hegel's school breaks apart, you know, on the left we have those praxis theologians, all the people on the left are praxis theologians that means uh, it is 
not enough any longer to interpret history, but we have to make it now. That was the, uh, the thesis about Feuerbach by Marx. Now, in the meantime, Adorno has turned that around. Because the whole praxis failed so miserably, and Alternative Future Number 3 has not appeared, and Marx went to Frankfurt in 1848 and thought it could happen there, but the bourgeoisie allied itself with the nobility instead of with the workers, and so it didn't happen. That's why fascism finally came. And so, so after all this disaster, it's time again to think again. So therefore, going back to Kant and going back to Schelling and, and so on and so on, in order to make a new push now. So they don't think that the counter-revolution in the um, uh, neoliberal counter-revolution will last forever, and what has happened now in the Ukraine shows that it does not last. That means the uh, revolution stirs again against the counter-revolution, and they had to expect that. You know, revolutions are finite, but counter-revolutions are also finite. So they just in Eastern Europe didn't buy the neoliberal thing. They were for misled for a short time, and now they they go their own way. And the attempt of neoliberals and fascists in Kiev failed. And the result is this uh, uh, this uh, thing there. The, 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 um, it's in Fairpol, the capital now, the new capital. And the Bastopol will be part of it, and it will all be a part of the Russian uh, thing. And the president could not say. It was a very resignation type of a of a, of a speech. He knows nothing can be changed. I mean, what do you want to do about the Crimea now? Do you want to take the Crimea back to Kiev against 97% of the votes? <laughs> that is uh, absolutely stupid. And you cannot do a thing about the eastern part now. It's a step, I think probably that's what will happen, uh, separating itself from the western part. The historical basis for this, the western part was always close to, to Poland, and so they will be a small type, of, and they will include that small part probably into the European Union, and they will pump a lot of money in it, and they, maybe it's very poor. Really, the, the wealth is all in the eastern part, but I think uh, we will push things into Kiev, and so that one part of Ukraine, that is what... But it's sad because, uh, you know, it was united for a short time, and now it falls apart again. And I think the World Bank and all this is, is somehow the purpose to uh, particularize things and... Uh, and they do this. There is an article somebody gave me where you see the millions they pay for parties, for journal propaganda, and so on, in order to get people apart from each other. And they were not able to, to get the Muslims, you know, in, in the Crimea against the, the Orthodox, and or the Orthodox against the Catholics, and so on. So it just didn't work. It, I mean, what we witnessed is the end of the neoliberal counter-revolution. At the time when the Americans don't even know that they made a counter-revolution. They think they made a revolution or whatever. So if you have a revolution and then you undo it, that's called a counter-revolution. And fascism is a counter-revolution, and that is why fascists were present there. Not alone, but the neoliberals are also counter-revolutionaries, so they have that in common, the counter-revolution, and that is what has come to its end now. Okay, so this, but that hasn't been translated, but I just want to mention that social interaction, right? That's also meat and purse, and so, so we have that in this country, and Apple, whom I showed you the last time, took that from here and translated it into German, and that produced Habermas to some extent, so that we see the connection. And here, there is this first as tragedy, then as fast, here's the airplane going down, and the very <laughs> miserable picture there. So that is Zizek again, and that is a Marxist thing, <laughs> that some things in history, first they happen as a tragedy, and then they happen as a comedy, afterwards a second time, and so that is what he did on this. But the word tragedy is important because uh, the idealists, in a certain sense, uh, they hoped for this future, but they had a tragic thing which they have in common with the prophets. If you read Jeremiah, for instance, or Isaiah, you see how the Babylonians fight against Israel, and then the Egyptians come and they fight against Babylon, or the Persians come and they slaughter and they butcher and they revenge, and so on and so on. That is what Hegel then calls the, uh, the slaughter bench of history. It's taken right out of Jeremiah, and so on. 
um, there is a goal and for Schopenhauer even the goal disappears and all what remains is the slaughter bench or the Golgotha of the historical process so now we can see the tragedy but uh, the farce or the comedy is harder to see so this is um, the book here by uh, Sid um, here is uh, something which is important for Habermas um, namely his uh, moral consciousness and there are several books by him so remember when we see the road map on the road map we have the personality human subjectivity we have the five human potentials there uh, and then uh, comes uh, the right uh, poverty and so on and the next one is social morality so uh, it's personal morality so uh, Habermas follows step by step Hegel's philosophy and transforms everything instead of talking about the notion of things he transforms it into action that's what the left does and so Habermas is on the left so one thing which he actualizes you could maybe call that is Hegel's idea of moral uh, of, uh, of morality of personal morality uh, which contains things like good and bad life or conscience or guilt and so on so uh, Habermas has uh, what has he done? He has transformed what Hegel calls the uh, um, personal morality into a field of action, moral interaction between people. So that is what the Frankfurt School and what the Marxists did already. Here is Jürgen Habermas once more, philosophical political profiles, and that shows what the Frankfurt theory, what they think about these different, so I just want to call you a few names uh, which he told us, Martin Heidegger there and then German idealism and the Jewish philosophy they have what we discussed today and then there's Heidegger and then there's Karl Jaspers um, uh, Habermas had a short contact with Karl Jaspers there's Arnold Gehnel, he's a Galen who is a very uh, 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 pessimistic uh, anthropologist and the same thing is with Helmut Plessner there then there is Ernst Bloch, who was very much important for the uh, for, for form and so on. Um, then Theodor Adorno. Uh, there is Alexander Michelin, who Michelin uh, and his wife, both of them, were psychoanalysts and worked in Frankfurt, and they became famous uh, after the war by writing books about in unable to be to mourn, unable to mourn. That means the Germans were not un were not able to repent, to regret what they had done, and so on. So they saw all these cases in Frankfurt and treated them. <coughs> From the very beginning, there was a Freudian Institute in Frankfurt, and there was the Marxist Institute, and they both worked together. After the war, the Mitchellists uh, recreated the Psychological Institute again, and so there are two institutes now, side by side there. And then Karl Löwit is an important fellow too, as far as a historian. Is so there's Ludwig Wittgenstein, an engineer, who uh, was very important for, for linguistics. There's Hannah Arendt, who we mentioned here. Uh, Wolfgang Abendrot, uh, he wrote the history of labor, of the labor movement, and very important for Habermas. There's Walter Benjamin, of course, who committed suicide in Port Bou. And there's Gershom Scholem, the uh, Kabbalist, uh, famous uh, from Berlin. And um, then we have uh, Max Horkheimer, of course. And there's Leo Löwenthal, a tiny little guy, also from Frankfurt. Uh, his heritage is still in Los Angeles there. Some things which were never allowed to be published, namely the uh, uh, study of American workers, the authoritarian personality in labor unions. And it hasn't been published yet. The other one about labor unions in Frankfurt, uh, labor uh, took years and decades until it came out. Okay, so that uh, that's a little book by Habermas where he shows, you know, all the connections between and it's a very rich type of a uh, rich that, type of that's that. in English too. You can get that. It's in English too. Okay. Yeah, and so I just want to give you a survey. So we're running quickly out of time. About ten minutes left. Oh my God. So, okay, this is uh, secret reports on Nazi Germany. So Franz Neumann, who wrote the most famous book about Nazism, the Behemoth, Behemoth, 
it's still uh, of actuality they have it Marcuse and Otto Kirchheimer they were hired by the uh, by the American government and they made reports and up into the Vietnam War Marcuse was still active there so we can look at this the next time a little bit more so we want to close that up um, here and go to our movie our movie is the to finish up the uh, Nuremberg trial of not the real Nuremberg trial for Goering and, and so on the uh, top nuts, but for the judges there was one for, for the medical doctors too because they had collaborated so let's look at this because we know that liberalism and fascism and socialism are the three paradigms which are very important for studying the critical theory no guarantees or withholding due process of law. The prosecution is calling into account for murder, brutalities, torture, atrocities. They share with all the leaders of the Third Reich responsibility for the most malignant, the most calculated, the most devastating crimes in the history of all mankind. And they are perhaps more guilty than some of the others. You have the ego so of that they have been majority the long before Hitler's rise to power. Their minds were warped at an early age by Nazi teachings. They embraced the ideologies of the Third Reich as educated adults. There is a liberal when they shouting the against fascism. Should have valued justice. Prosecutor. Here they'll receive the justice they deny others. They'll be judged according to the evidence presented in this court. The prosecution has nothing more. Now it comes the little yeah, judge from the Hicktown in the middle of world history. That is Shell. I don't know if you know Maria Shell. She was a very famous actress, I think she became mentally ill from Switzerland. He's from Switzerland too. Extraordinary. Good Herr Richter, may I please the tribunal. It is not only a great honor, it is not only a great honor, but an even from both the house for also a great challenge for an advocate. Even Gericht by the house to raise this tribunal in its past. The entire civilized world, that even Potsdam Träume, will follow closely what we do here. And it is a kind of a process, for this is not an ordinary trial. And it is a kind by any means of the accepted parochial sense. The anerkannte Sinn dieses Gericht, the avowed purpose of this tribunal, is broader than the visiting of retribution on a few men. It is dedicated to the reconsecration the temple of justice. It is dedicated to finding a code of justice the whole world will be responsible to. So that probably now develop further into that law of which the president talks so much today. It will be established and the uh, war criminal tribunal in the in heart is the continuation of this but we have not signed on to it. That is another thing. So because we know that we commit those crimes and we don't want to be caught there. So Bush should be there, his cabinet should be there, and nobody sent them there. This responsibility will not be found only in documents that no one contests or denies. It will be found in considerations of a political or social nature. It will be found, most of all, in the character of men. What is the character of Ernst Young? Let us examine his life for a moment. He was born in 1885, received the degree of Doctor of Law in 1910, became a judge in East Prussia in 1940. Following World War I, he became one of the leaders of the Weimar Republic and was one of the framers of its democratic constitution. In subsequent years, he achieved international fame, not only for his work as a great jurist, but also as the author of legal textbooks which are still used in universities all over the world. He became Minister of Justice in Germany in 1935. If Ernst Janning is to be found guilty, certain implications 
Mr. Wright. A judge does not make the law. He carries out the laws of his country. The statement, my country, right or wrong, was uh, expressed by the great American which we have taken over. It is no less true for a German patriot. Should Liberals John Steinbeck have carried have out the laws of his country? Or should he have refused to carry them out and become a traitor? This is the crux of the issue at the bottom of this trial. The defense is as dedicated to finding responsibility as is the prosecution. For it is not only Ernst Janning who is on trial here. The German people. Tribunal will recess until further notification. A little bit senile, the one there. But Yanni is still here in his mind, I think.
she's in the best way to find the self-consciousness. You are the grandpa. Yes, there you go. What's that? She said, goodbye, Grandpa. There's where the Nuremberg festivities took place. That's where the anti-Semitic laws were made and announced. Just like the old Romans. You're aware we go to Rome, the heart of fascism, right? Right. Or just about the work. Whatever you want to. Okay.